So far, we've created shapes and patterns in the previous video. In this video, we'll build a full material. Let's start by creating a new substance graph. Instead of the empty template, we'll select the metallic roughness template. After naming it fabric material, our graph is created. We see that this graph is not empty. It has a number of pre-created nodes. These output nodes are named and labeled for you in advance. You'll find outputs for base color, normal, roughness, and more. These outputs form a full material together, and the usage label helps applications tell which output is which. We want to base our materials on the patterns we created before. Let's drag the polka dots into our material graph. Like we've seen in the first video, we'll introduce colors by using blend nodes with uniform color nodes. The monochrome polka dots are used as an opacity input to blend between two colors. To add more colors, we add our tiger stripes pattern. Each time I want to add another color on top, I connect the previous blend node to the background and a new uniform color to the foreground, my pattern to the opacity input. It would be good to modify the tiger pattern a bit. Looking closely at its properties, it has no parameters available. We'll have to add these ourselves first. If we open the tiger graph, it replaces our material graph, so it makes it hard to jump between the two. Instead, if you click the push pin at the top right of a graph before opening another one, you can have multiple graphs open in tabs. So with the tiger graph open, we find nodes that have key parameters. The tile generator node has the random mask and rotation settings, for example. Once you find your parameter, click the button to the right of its name and choose Expose as new graph input. A new dialog opens up where you can customize the look of the parameter UI. We'll rename the label to Coverage and remove the color group below that. Once we click OK, the parameter is no longer accessible and turns blue. This tells us it's been exposed. If we jump back to the material graph and find the tiger node, we see the coverage slider is now available. Make sure to double click on your tiger node to preview changes after switching graphs. Let's repeat that a few more times. I'll expose the rotation control and the tile generator of the tiger graph. It gets added as another parameter below in the order of exposing. So we go back to the tiger graph and expose the size of the original shape node as size. We can even change labels of individual components to width and length. With those parameters exposed, I can modify the tiger node in the material to make it look different. If I then add another tiger node and blend an orange color on top, I can make my second tiger node look different from the first one. To practice, let's repeat it one more time for the polka dots graph. I'd like to have control over the amount of dots. If I open the polka dots graph and find the tile generator, I'll expose the X amount parameter and name it just amount. However, if I test the parameter out, it's affecting the proportions of my dots in a way that I don't really want. So going back to the dots graph, I find the Y amount parameter and open the expose menu. Instead of exposing it as a new separate input, I pick an existing control at the bottom. So amount in this case. This lets me control two separate parameters with a single expose control. So I can set the amount of dots without worrying about the proportions. We're pretty happy with our colored pattern for now. Let's connect it to the top base color output. We're building material and we haven't used the 3D view yet. That's easy to do. Right click in an empty space and click view outputs in 3D view. This lets me check my material in 3D. It looks pretty flat, so nothing like fabric yet. Uh, to improve that, we drag our fabric pattern graph in. You can easily tell the normal map output by its purple color. So we can connect our fabric pattern to the normal conversion node that sits just before the output. It doesn't look very nice yet, the, the scale is off. To change the scale, let's try a transformation 2D node. We'll scale the pattern down, holding shift to lock proportions. The scale is getting closer, but if we press spacebar in the 2D view, we activate a tiling preview. Checking the edges of our material, we see it doesn't tile properly. There's a seam due to our freehand transforming. So a good node to help fix that is the safe transform node. Instead of the regular transform, it's a modified node that lets you do correct tiling with a single slider without any seam issues. Let's set it to eight. 
Now the intensity of the normal map is still a bit too strong. Selecting the normal node so that converts our grayscale to a normal map, we can adjust the intensity using a slider. Apart from our normal map, we can also connect the pattern to the height output. This is optional, and usually height is used for big displacement, like details that stick out more than just a few millimeters. Once we have a normal map, we can use this to improve our base color. Let's search for Curvature and add the Curvature Smooth node. If we connect our normal map, we can see it extracts some grayscale details for the edges of our pattern. Once we add a blend node and connect our curvature and color, we get that problematic red connection. This is because blend doesn't allow mixing colors with grayscale. To fix it, select the red line and add a gradient map node. This node converts grayscale to color. Now we can set our blend mode to overlay to add the subtle curvature details. This is a nice trick for any material. It adds more life and detail to a flat looking material. Our last channel to tackle is the roughness. We can use the existing uniform color and change that base color a bit. It looks very uniform and we want to have shinier reflections for the orange and white stripes like plastic printed on fabric. I'll move the first color back and add a blend note. Then, Connect our first tiger stripe mask to the opacity. Then I'll add another blend node and connect the second tiger stripe mask because I want to use both. You can see the difference already, but our blend is just using black as default. We'll add a uniform color node again and hook it up. This time the red connection can be fixed on the color itself. We don't need a gradient map node. So you click on the color node and change the color mode to grayscale. This changes the output type of the node. Then we can just change the value until it looks right in the 3D view. With this done, you see how building a material means multiple nodes affecting each other. Some channels use common mask between them. Some have unique nodes just for that one output. The advantage of using common masks means changing a single node will affect base color and roughness at the same time, like our tiger stripes. With the material done, we can send it to Substance 3D Painter as well. Don't forget to go into the graph properties and change the type attribute to material to make sure it's interpreted correctly. Then it's always best to save all your packages by going to File, Save All. After that, we can do the familiar right-click and send to Painter. In Painter, we see our material in the Assets panel, and we can drag it into our layer stack. After some masking and changing the scale, we turn off the height channel, as Painter uses both normal and height at the same time, and this looks too strong. So this looks okay, but we notice that we have no parameters at all for our material. We can't even change colors. So that's easy to fix. Let's go back to Designer, and we find the output color for our pattern nodes, and we expose them. I'll name the first one color one, and then use different numbers for exposing the next three. This ensures I can tell them apart easily. So to update an existing asset after you've already sent it over, we use the Publish button at the top of the Explorer in the middle, and choose Resend to Substance 3D Painter. In Painter, the asset is then updated in your Assets panel, but you'll have to relink it to the layer to see the updated result by dragging it in again. This resets your settings, so be careful and turn off the height again. Now, you see we can adjust our colors and tweak our material. Let's practice that some more by exposing some more parameters, like the base roughness value as well as the normal intensity slider. You don't have to send it to Painter to get a preview of these parameters. By double-clicking on an empty area, you'll find a list of all your exposed parameters under the Input Parameters rollout. If you click on the Preview tab in the middle, you can see what your parameters will look like. I'd like to group all the colors together as they take up a lot of space. So I go back to the Parameters tab and I can open up each individual parameter and modify their name and look. There's a Group setting where I can type in a new group name colors in this case. For the next parameters, I can just pick the group in the drop-down menu, so from my previous typed-in name. 
let's resend that material to Painter again. Then in Painter, I'll update it the same way. And now I can test some of the new parameters. It would be nice to include some presets for color variations so I can cycle between a few palettes. Back in Designer, I'll find the Presets tab under Input Parameters all the way to the right. Here, I can start modifying my parameters. The workflow is simple. Change your parameters, type in a label for your preset, and press New to store a new preset. I'll create two different presets, including a second one with crazy neon colors. Once that's resent to Painter, we can pick any of our embedded presets from the drop-down menu, letting me quickly change material style. You can also publish your material for use outside of Substance Painter. This is done slightly different by right-clicking on a package and choosing Publish SBSAR file. You get a publishing dialog where you choose the file path. You can even generate a thumbnail that helps you when using this material in a large library, like with Adobe Bridge. An SBSAR material can then be used in any application that supports it. In Substance 3D Stager, you use File, Import, Place Material on Selection. You get access to all the same parameters for tweaking. We have a separate video on Substance 3D Stager. If you can't use the SBSAR format, Designer lets you export as bitmaps. You can only export a single graph at a time, so right-click on a graph, not a package, and choose Export Outputs as Bitmap. The bitmap dialog is fairly straightforward to use. Choose Path, File Type and Naming, and hit Export. Once done, you get a bitmap for each output channel of your graph that can be loaded by any other 3D application. And that's it for this tutorial. We've gone from very basic nodes to creating shapes and patterns to making your own material with custom parameters. Now you can get started and create your own materials.